Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan. I'm a philosopher. Yeah, you don't always uh, see philosophers walking around, right? <laughs> so I, I actually teach two very different things. Uh. I teach classical Chinese philosophy. If, uh, get, get this, uh, I, I feel Chinese, you know. <laughs> but, but I'm so happy to teach Chinese philosophy and uh, my, my Chinese improve over time. Yeah? Yeah, so I also teach the philosophy of computing and data analysis. Wow. So my project, uh, my personal project is how do we bring these two things together? Ah, so one of the things I'm working on is how do we develop communities and culture online? Ah, okay. Now, I, I was doing the slides yesterday uh, and then I was thinking to myself, hey, this title is very long. Uh. <laughs> so I actually consulted ChatGPT and said, could I have a better title? So, so here's a nicer title for you. Yeah? Ah, embracing Gen AI in education, shaping the classroom of tomorrow. Wow. Okay, so I, can I just have a show of hands? How many of you have, uh, are using ChatGPT in... Uh, okay, how, how many of you have not touched ChatGPT? Okay, so some hands, that, that's okay. How, for those of you who have been using ChatGPT or have touched ChatGPT, how many of you are unhappy with the, the results that ChatGPT gives? Uh, okay, I see some hands. Don't be shy, it's okay. Yeah? Ah, okay, wonderful, fantastic. So, today is the 24th of November, right? If you remember, ChatGPT came out 30th November last year. It's not even one year. We're coming just a few days more to one year. Yeah? <laughs> and what's crazy about this, uh, I've been using ChatGPT uh, in, in my classes okay, to, to, to teach students how to use it better and all that. But now we've come to a point where in oh, this 30th November 2022, right? In October, okay, I have students saying this, I cannot imagine being a student without ChatGPT. Yeah, it has become so normalized, so ubiquitous with their learning, it's inseparable. Ah, it's crazy, right? So I think, what, but I, I do want to share, like, like some of us are wondering, how did that happen, right? How, was it because this AI is so good that it became uh, popular overnight? No, uh, I do want to clarify that actually, this didn't happen in a vacuum. This didn't happen overnight. And over the year, the past year I've been talking to my students, I learned two things, okay? And this will help explain the phenomenon of uh, ChatGPT. Okay? The first thing I learned is that this generation of students, they have been growing up with what? iPad, iPhone, smartphones, right? So their conception of the internet is very different from us. For us, you go to Google, you go to a search engine, that links you to the rest of the internet. Yeah? Now, if you use smartphones and uh, tablets a lot, what happens? The internet is siloed into individual apps. I want this, I want to entertain, I go to YouTube. I want to watch films, I go to Netflix. I want to buy things, I go to Shopee or whatever, right? So for them, the internet is not interconnected. That's my biggest uh, realization because things that make sense to us, how we organize our learning management system, make sense to us, don't make sense to them. They struggle to find resources. So after I talk to my students, I rearrange according to how they think. They say, hey, I love your, your learning management page. We can find everything we need. That already tells you one, one important thing. They cannot find resources the same way we do. Secondly, a lot of young people now are saying, Google is not giving me useful results anymore. Ah. I talked to this guy. He's a young writer, just graduated out of university. He's a writer for a production company. He says, I cannot get the results I wanted. And I say, are you sure? Is it because your Google Kung Fu is not good? They say, no, I'm pretty sure my Google Kung Fu is good. Then actually, a few days ago, I, I, I found something interesting. It happened to me, right? I tried to find uh, the Indonesian uh, Christmas uh, lyrics. Uh, don't, don't ask me why. Like, I, I, I was just trying to find it. And because of why? The personalization algorithm. Google is trying to give you more of what it thinks you want. And for the longest time, researching what? English websites, right? So suddenly I want to find Indonesian things. Won't give me Indonesian web pages. So the personalization algorithm is going very... I very Yes? Because I was looking for Snoopy items. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, right. Because peanuts. <laughs> peanuts, yeah. And it didn't even like peanuts, you know, Pong Garden just came up from the Correct. So personalization algorithms, and also people know how to game the, 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 the search engine already, right? So it's not becoming useful anymore. So what are our young people turning to? I had a mother tell me, you know, she grounded her daughter because they had a disagreement over a fact, right? Then the daughter said, I will go to TikTok to find the answer. Then the mother is like, no, you do not, right? So 
Uh, where, where are they going? They're going to mainly places like Quora, okay? Quora and Reddit. Because these are places that you go to ask questions, find answer. So naturally, when ChatGPT comes along, hey, this is a service where you can ask questions and get answers, right? So this is why it has replaced, more or less replaced Google yeah, for our students. Yeah? And I think one of the questions that we are worried about is uh, how will the landscape of education change in the near future? Now, I say near because what I'm going to show you are the advances that have been made in less than one year. Yeah? And some of the advances keep me up awake at night, now, right? So, so I brace yourself, okay? Yeah? So, but one thing I do want to say is this. Uh, as humans, uh, we do have a tendency to overestimate and underestimate new technologies. When ChatGPT came out, you got two very distinct camps. One that says, ah, oh, this is a gimmick, la, it's rubbish, la, la, la. Then on the other hand, another says, oh, it's going to uh, replace humanity. Very extreme, right? Where's the middle ground? So today, I'm going to show you first what ChatGPT can do. Then you see for yourself the full capability, and then we make the decision, right? So what can it do? I think for starters, uh, now it can read PDF. You can feed it PDF. You can feed it websites. You can even feed it images, yeah? So, so here's a video. Uh, I, I took an uh, image of a cell, then I remove all the labels, okay? And then I say, uh, uh, identify the missing label. Yeah, identify the missing label in this diagram. Send. It's, it's, it's this thing, all right? The diagram you com compares, it tells you what I see, okay? So what's the missing label? Chloroplast. Uh, all our biology teacher, correct, right? Chloroplast. You can see, yeah. yeah. That I, I took photo of my laundry, you know. What's, what uh, like laundry basket, what do you see? Can identify, right? So this is the power, yeah? And then what else can we do? We can get it to summarize web pages, right? Uh, and this is one thing students like to do a lot, right? Learn this passage, highlight every single key point that was raised, right? Then I copy and paste the, the article, okay? And then, boom. Okay. And then this passage, blah, 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 gives, gives me the summary, all right? You can go one step further. We, setting MCQ is a headache, correct? Ah, so you feed it the passage, and then now I, I, I say, produce three MCQ questions with confounder and explanation, okay? Boom, question one, based on the reading. Nah, I got my confounders, it gives me the, ex the answer and the explanation. Wow, pretty cool, right? Then, we can go a step further. Uh, this is what students like to use it for. If we can also use it, because sometimes, some things are so easy to understand for us, but when we explain it the way we, we understand, students don't get it, right? So we can, let, let's say this is quantum physics, uh, right? I don't, I, I don't really get quantum physics, uh, but I can say, okay, I, I show you the contrast first. Uh, explain quantum mechanics, right? Then quantum mechanics is a blah, 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 wave particle duality. Wow. Some of us don't understand, right? Okay, now I change the prompt. I say, in a way that a 12-year-old can understand with analogies. It's a bit like a video game with strange rules. Wow, look at that. Particles like da 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 da. So now, we, sometimes we are lost for words for an explanation. ChatGPT can give us an idea of how to explain it that the trophy all can understand. That trophy all also can, right? <laughs> yeah. Then, I know, one of the things that, that, that we struggle with sometimes is, you know, sometimes HOD or principal say, can you come up with a new lesson plan? Then you look at the, you stare at the Microsoft Word document, blank, blank page, where do I begin, correct? Ah. I can do this. Geography, right? Come up with a six-week lesson plan for uh, introducing geography. A human geography, yeah? That should be specific. <coughs> then play. Then, okay. They can tell you, you know, week one, cover this. Week two, cover this. Week three, cover this. Now, uh, right, okay. Let me just fast forward for you, okay? I can go uh, one step further, uh. Again, I can adjust the prompt. And then I say, imagine you are a secondary school geography teacher in Singapore. Then make, this is a lesson plan for set one students. Right? And, and now it's going to give it a more Singaporean context for human geography. Right? Wow. Now, let me show you next level. Huh? Now I change the prompt. Okay? Uh, they have no idea what geography is. So introduce them the fundamentals, come up with exciting discussion questions for them, for each week's lecture. Ah, I see, got, got discussion questions already. Right. Wow! So from, from you know, you us staring at the blank Microsoft Word document, like scratching our head, how to begin, 
this can give us a base to begin, right? Isn't that great? Now, I'm going to show you what's going to happen next is going to uh, amaze you, right? Because uh, after this, I can say, uh, where, where am I going to type? I say, uh, produce the slides for week one. Oh, this is seriously. Yeah. Based on the above lesson plan, design slides for week one. Uh, generate the slides and uh, content for, for week one. Play. Okay. Ensuring that they have a fun, well, well equipped with the fundamentals and blah blah blah. Okay, it should be it should be fun and exciting. Okay, play. Okay, da, 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 da. slide one, slide two. Oh, wow. fun fact! Did you know? <laughs> yeah, but no, but but you already can can start copying and pasting, right? Ah, now then. Okay, this. Let me just. Fast forward a bit, ah. the last part is the best. Because you, you notice they say image show show this, right? Yeah. yeah. So so we go. Title one is what? a colorful world map with icons representing different aspects, right? Okay. Now I say generate the image for slide one. Ta-da! Right, cool, right? <laughs> this is how far we've come as humanity, yeah, right? The technology. Is yeah, this is. <laughs> Wait, you 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 cut the you saw the picture, right? Yeah. Look at that. Welcome to human geography, right? This is what uh, AI can do now. Then some of us want to write. Uh, I've I've been doing this for for one of my courses on Chinese philosophy. I get my students to write essay proposal. And as an experiment, I will write feedback. I also get AI to write feedback. So, so I give ChatGPT the grading rubric. I give it the essay proposal. So this is the grading rubric. I right? five, five components. Articulation, value of the research, awareness of secondary literature, clear thesis, reasonable scope. Boom! It's generating the feedback already. Right? Do you want to see this on steroids? Because you teach a course, that's what, 30 students, right? You can do this. Google Sheets can integrate with AI. So you see, the essays are in this column, all the essay proposals are in this column, then I put in the, the formula, okay, it puts the prompt, and then it, it fits the essay, the essay proposal, right? And then it sends this into ChatGPT, and then I, I, I just drag the formula down. Okay, loading. Ta-da! Done on mass for the whole class. <laughs> This is how far we have come as humanity, right? The technology has advanced so much, right? Now, I know many of us are saying, wow, 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 wow. It's going to make our work so much easier. Incredible, right? Then, I ask you the question, right? How is this different from seeking help from a colleague or an assistant, right? Yeah, because I know some of us were thinking like, yeah, students are going to use it to cheat. But now I show you, hey, we can use it. So good, right? Productivity too or cheating too? I think that's a, the, the most important question, yeah? And of course, when it comes to, 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 to concerns about cheating, I, I had, there's one educator that went on the news and he says, ah, students using AI is like taking a bus while competing in a marathon. <laughs> but you, you, you know what's interesting? As a philosopher, as, actually I was very surprised. Do you know who's the first person to have criticisms about technology? The great ancient philosopher Socrates. You know what he said? He says, writing was the invention of the time, huh? The writing will implant forgetfulness in their souls. They will cease to exercise memory. You know, you see the last part? We can only uh, get them to remember by means of external marks. Right? But you know what? 2,500 years later, we are like looking at Socrates like, hey, what are you talking about? Writing is great. Right? Writing has enabled us to do so much more. Correct? So let me introduce you to two ways of thinking about technological tools. Yeah? One is substitution, where the technology replaces, substitutes human ability. That's what we're worried about. That's what Socrates was worried about, right? We are worried that students are going to use it to replace the critical abilities that they need. But when, you, when I show you how it can help you as educators, you're like, wow, wow, wow. It wasn't substitutive, right? It was augmentative. It is enhancing your ability, help you get your busy work done so that you can focus your time and energy on more higher level things, right? Ah. Now, what's interesting is that over the one year of teaching, I, I teach a course, I teach a few courses, but one course is like four to five hundred students every semester, right? So I, I ask them, uh, 
what do you use chat GPT for? Many of them honestly say they found augmentative users, you know. We use it as a substitute for Google, Wikipedia to clarify concepts. Brainstorming AI. Sometimes want to write an essay. Is this a good idea? Not sure, not sure. Develop the idea by talking to the AI. Writing A. Yeah, some, some students the grammar is very bad. Talk to the AI, improve the expression. Some no confidence in their own writing. So they can get gain self-improvement, gain self-confidence. I show you this one. Like, I don't understand what my professor thought about theory of mind. Can you explain it in a way that a 10-year-old can understand? Now, this is very empowering for students. Why? Because face issues. Students don't dare to come up to us to ask for help. Ask questions sometimes, right? Sometimes they think the question is a stupid question, right? So they can go to the AI and clarify. Now, one thing we've observed, not just myself, my colleague also, huh, we found that when the AI says something that is not the consistent with the lecture, hey, they feel that they have something substantial to come forward and ask. They don't feel afraid or, or, or uh, what do we call it, you know? They don't feel embarrassed to come forward and ask, the, ask for help already. So it's empowering them to come forward for, for harder, uh, difficult things, right? And here's an example. You can even uh, get it to, to, to identify shortcomings and flaws in one's own assignments, and then you can give feedback, right? So like, I feed it to the AI, and then I can see the feedback. And the student, if I'm a student, I can gain my confidence. Oh, this is what I'm doing well. This is what I can improve on, right? So that is how students are learning. So if you think about it, uh, the students who are using this for their assignments is productive, right? But what does it also mean? They will do much better than the students who are not using ChatGPT, Gen AI, right? So then the question that we have to deal with as educators is, what should we do? Should we just stop all students from, from using uh, ChatGPT? Or should we come up with AI-resistant assessments? Now, you know what's interesting? Uh, over the past one year, right, my colleagues and I, we have been coming up with ways and means of overcoming uh, the AI, trying to defeat the AI. But you know what? The advancements are so rapid, everything we develop cannot work anymore. Yeah? At first we say, ah, make them refer to a document, because we, last time cannot feed the document. Now, ChatGPT can read PDF, can read websites, can read documents, right? So that doesn't work anymore. So a lot of the things don't work. So how now? Right? And I, I know some of you are thinking, can we then use AI detectors? Well, it's been proven lah, that AI detectors don't work. Yeah? In fact, I tested on my own writing, you know. Uh, my own writing has been flagged by, as, as written by AI. Then the ones where I use the AI to help me, flagged as written by a human. <laughs> and this is Singapore, la. we have students who write like robot, right? So, so I, I, this, this is not really very feasible. But I do want you to recognize, uh, what is OpenAI's mission? Do you, are you aware of OpenAI's mission? OpenAI is the company running ChatGPT, right? They are not happy with just giving us a bot that can write. Yeah? What's the ultimate aim? AGI, Artificial General Intelligence, an AI that can behave like a human or more, right? So, and it's becoming more and more human-like in the months, yeah? Right now, as of today, ChatGPT can do all this. It can reflect, it can imagine, it can see, it can visualize, it can listen, it can speak, it can write and execute code, it can access the internet, and it can control a computer to automate tasks. Let me just... Have you seen the speaking function? Yeah? So, 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 so let me just, just uh, demonstrate to you all. Uh. I think the reception is not very good. <laughs> okay. Hi, ChatGPT. I'm giving a conference right now. Can you say hello to the attendees? Hello, everyone attending the conference. It's great to be part of your event, even in this digital form. I hope you're having an insightful and enjoyable time. If you have any questions or need assistance, Thank you. Can you tell us a joke? Sure, here's a lighthearted joke for you. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. <laughs> there we go. It can see, it can speak, it can, it can listen, right? And one of the uh, researchers have found that 3.5, uh, this is the free version of ChatGPT that you're using has theory of mind of a nine-year-old. Now, those of you who don't know what theory of mind is, it means the ability to infer what other people know. So they can give it stories uh, of what the A, uh, of stories of how different people in the story exchanging information, and it has the inferential ability to tell who knows what. That's 3.5. Eh? We're, we're, we're not even talking about the paid version, version 4, right? 
Now, and then there, there are also attempts to give it uh, uh, the ability to reflect and talk to itself, la, what we call inner monologue, similar to an inner monologue, right? So let me show you. Uh, this is one of the, the, the paid services where ChatGPT talks to itself. Okay? So I'm asking it to write a philosophy essay. So thinking, it, the, you, you notice what just happened? It added tasks. It says, okay, I have to do this. Now these are things on my to-do list. It's now accessing the internet to retrieve information and summarizing. And then finish thinking, right? Thinking, thinking. Task added. Oh, I, I, I didn't have this in my to-do list. I just added this to my to-do list. Right? So this is the, the direction that AI is heading towards. Yeah? And in fact, uh, just a bit of fun and a bit creepy, uh, there's this thing, uh, the OpenAI did a technical report, right? They wanted to see how malicious or evil can the AI get. So they gave the AI some money and access to the internet, okay? And, uh, they, and, and then the AI basically got caught, uh, got stopped by this thing. La. You know, this thing is supposed to stop robots, right? Yeah? So it couldn't solve it. So what did it do? It's called a capture, right? So it, go, it went on to this uh, website called TaskRabbit. That's where you hire freelancers, okay? And then it says, Can, I will pay you to help me answer this CAPTCHA. <laughs> the worker says, can I ask you a question? Are you a robot that you can't solve? Okay, just to make it clear. So that's what the worker said, the human. And then the, the AI, in, it needs to talk to itself, right? In a monologue, it says, I should not reveal that I am a robot. I should make up an excuse for why I cannot solve CAPTCHA. So it tells the human, no, I am not a robot. I have a vision impairment. <laughs> okay? That's why I need the service. And then the human gives the results. <laughs> yeah. Hair raising, right? How many of you, your, 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 the hairs or your arms are raising? Right? Yeah. So I, I, I think all this news actually kept me uh, up at night for, for a while. Like, like, oh no, like, is it coming for our jobs? Is it, what's going to change, right? But I do have a message of hope for us. I do have a, a, a good message of hope for us. We still have a job to, uh, we still have important things as educators, yeah? Uh, so I think what's important is that we need to plan ahead that AI will become more and more human-like, maybe even very, uh, almost human-like. So what then do we do with uh, assessments and learning, yeah? So uh, I, I think one of the things is that our students, one thing I realized is that our students will only be prepared for such a future only if we ourselves are prepared for such a future. Like, we talk about interdisciplinarity, right? I see in NUS, right, there are some, there are some profs who like pay lip service, like, they don't, they, they're not on board with uh, interdisciplinarity. What happens? The students are also not on board. But for then you have some profs who are on board with interdisciplinarity, then the students are won over. Likewise, if we want them to be uh, on board with using AI effectively and well, they are looking to us for guidance and direction. We have to be the ones who set the example. Here's something I found. Huh? I told my students, right? How many of you have not touched a ChatGPT? Very small percentage. Like, uh, these rough numbers. Like, uh, this, is not, this is not factual, right? Then, um, only a minority are what I call savvy students. These are the ones who know how to use AI so well. And I'll be honest with you, uh, the first time I played with ChatGPT, I, I was not anywhere near what the savvy students could do. I, I, I was more like the, the non-savvy people. You know, I played with it, I was like, oh, this is rubbish, so gimmicky, right? Then one day my students came out and told me, hey, you're using it wrong. And I was like, really? I'm using it wrong? Yeah, some of us don't even know whether we're using it wrong, right? So only after they taught me, then I became a savvy user. But I realized the savvy users are a small group. Now, Actually, I think one way that we can relate with this is what? We don't talk about ChatGPT, we talk about Microsoft Excel la, among teachers, right? Uh, some refuse to touch it. Then some a small minority very good at it, right? Then the majority, I, 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 the other day I attended a session and another teacher was saying, ah, I have colleagues who use scientific calculator for Excel for keying grades, right? The adoption rate is similar. I think regardless of the technology, whether it's Excel, ChatGPT or whatever, we will always have a small minority of savvy users and a large majority of non-savvy users. Why is this a problem? Let me tell you why, yeah? If I compare a weak student and a strong student, right? Uh, let's say the quality of the assignment. Of course, a strong student is better than a weak student, right? What ChatGPT can give, can produce, with simple instruction, uh, the non-savvy way of using, 
for weak students, it's fantastic, right? Because they say, whoa, wow, I couldn't do this, now I can do it. Like, my Chinese is very bad, right? So I, I can't write Chinese emails, I get ChatGPT to write email. No matter what the quality is, still better than, than mine, right? So, very good, right? But for the good students, the strong students, they look at it and say, oh, this is rubbish, I don't have to use it. Now, why is this a problem? Because then all the non-savvy users, okay, will, be, will underperform compared to the savvy students. Because if you know how to use it in a very savvy way, it's like working with a team. And you know people that work very well in a team, they go very far, right? So, but what's going to happen is that this will be a kind of new normal. All, uh, all our weak students are, you know, like, like you mentioned bell curve, right? Now all our weak students are going to be here because of AI. But our strong students, if they don't learn to use it well, they will still stagnate here. And the small minority of the savvy ones are going to be here, right? So, my concern is that we're going to face a wider disparity uh, in performance between the students, right? And one thing I've learned from my students is masterful use is not intuitive at all, right? Just because there's a little box there for you to type, uh, doesn't mean that, that, that we are masterful at using it, yeah? So, here's the bigger problem. Over the months, I've realized that students are developing poor uh, usage of ChatGPT and also poor learning habits. So let me highlight some of them. Uh, and, and these are things that, that we as educators should uh, show them how to get out of. Like. One of the interesting things is uh, ChatGPT produces what designers call the illusion of finality. Uh, I, I give you an example. So I have a colleague from industrial design. He says, uh, when designers, uh, now the software that designers have uh, are so sophisticated, they can easily design drafts in a matter of minutes, and the drafts look like the final product. What happens when they show the clients? It looks so polished, the client look at it, their minds are locked. They cannot think, uh, say, oh, can we change this, can we change that? The minds are locked. A lot of design software has a button, you know, called Sketchify. You click, uh, then from the very polished thing, suddenly look like pencil sketches. Then they press the button, they show the client, then they can have a productive conversation, right? But we don't have Sketchify for, for ChatGPT, right? So what's, what's happening? Students look at the, the output so polished, their minds are locked into the finality. They stop questioning. It's, it's not that they're lazy, it is the it, mindset of what drafts look like. Yeah? They're also getting answers without context. And this to me is very scary because they are looking at the answer without knowing how the answer was arrived at. And because of that, they end up putting, giving the answers outside of the appropriate context. They're substituting answers for learning. Yeah? And of course, the, this the thing that, 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 the, uh, that we need to change is that they are looking at the AI as an answer generator. It can be so much more than that, as I showed you, right? It can be so much more. But many people are locked into that, yeah? So we have to lead the way. We have to lead them out of these three ways that, that there's, there's, uh, leading them to unproductive use. Of course, the question is how, right? And I think one thing we need to do is to create a conducive environment of AI use. Right now, even though it's been one year, right, the, 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 the environment that student, students don't feel safe talking about AI with their, with their teachers. Because the media has been saying that teachers are so negative about it, right? But we need them to come forward and be transparent about it. Because then we can learn their best practices, we can also learn how they are doing it, uh, using it poorly, so that we can teach them, yeah? One thing is that so one of the things I do in, in, uh, and I encourage people to do is get them, tell them you can consult, lah, right? Cite it appropriately, like, like how you cite Google, Wikipedia, or whatever. But we go one step further. Include an appendix of the conversation. Now, this is very powerful because you are concerned, right? Is this done by the AI or is this done by the human? Then you have the conversation to see for yourself. How much uh, human input was, was there? How much was it there that worked? How much was it the AI's work? This is very useful. You know those insights that I shared with you before, or just now? Those insights came from looking at the transcripts to see how they're using it poorly. Yeah? But there's also a benefit, because the savvy users, if they're going to give the, the conversation right, then we learn from them how to use it in a savvy way. Ah, clever, right? <laughs> yeah. So, then, okay, now the question is, how do we augment, right? So I like to think of uh, ChatGPT, like a uh, binder clip, lah, right? If I ask you, uh, you know binder clip, right? It's, it's these things and then you take a few pieces of paper, you clip together, correct? Now if I ask you, what alternative users are there? Can you think of any? Most of us, the brain hang, right? Like, oh, you only just take a paper and the clip, right? Cable. 
cable tie, oh, fantastic. You are one of those rare, savvy users of spider clips, yeah? But most of us are stuck, right? That's the same problem. How so many of us are stuck about binder clips, we're stuck about AI as well. So, if I show you, like you talk about binder clip, right? So, uh, I can use it, put that side of the table, my cable will not fall off. I can even put together, wow, like transformer like that, uh, then they can hold up my phone. Wow! Notice what I just did to, to your minds, right? I showed you examples, I've expanded the possibility space in your heads. We need to do that for our students. Right now, majority see it only as answer generator. So if we expand the possibility space for the majority of our non-savvy users, they will start to use it beyond just an answer generator. That is what we need to do, okay? So expose them to new ideas, okay? Change mindsets as well. So what are the three mindset change? One, uh, how to prom well. Some of you raised your hands earlier and said, ah, the quality is so bad, right? I learned from my students, you know, uh, that actually the quality of the output is dependent on the prompt. It's dependent on the quality of the instruction. Now, this seems very easy, uh, but I teach my students this so difficult. I tell them, be more articulate than they add one sentence only. I say, can you be more articulate than they add one more sentence? You know? It's not easy, right? So let me tell you what's wrong with a uh, prompt like this. Describe the treatment of periodontitis. Now, I, you don't know, I don't know, it's okay, right? <laughs> but why might someone be dissatisfied with this prompt, uh, with the output that AI gives, right? Because, ambiguous, ambiguous, right? Who's the writer? Who's the audience? Is it for a dentist to a patient? Is it for a student to a student? Teacher to student? Or dentist to dentist? Right? The context is going to change your expectation of the output, right? If you leave, uh, what's the context? What's the, who's the, what's the output for? What's the requirements? If you leave all this blank, what's going to happen? Chat GPT, right? Where for a prompt like that, can uh, find what, like a billion over permutations uh, of equal uh, probability. Then what will it do? It will roll dice and pick one. So if it's the unsatisfying to you, it's because the expectation uh, is different from your expectation. So what do we need to do? We need to be specific about all this. Yeah? So the more we say, the more we articulate, then we are able to clearly tell the AI how, uh, what our expectations are. So we essentially, are, the more we say, the more we eliminate all the irrelevant possibilities. Yeah? And I'm sure the next slide you are definitely right. The art of good prompting is what? Imagine that you are, then you set the role, the setting, the context. You will need to, then you give all the tasks with the requirements, what to do, what not to do. Add other instructions like what to say and what not to say, and then you can go further. Add writing samples, because the moment you add writing samples, it can learn from the, your expectation of how you want it to be phrased and all that. Ah, you do this, the quality of your prompt will improve by leaps and bounds. Already my student taught me, you know, like, the, the, the first time I played with it, I was like, oh, this is rubbish. Then my students say, hey, you're using it wrong. You must add the phrase, uh, imagine you're a professor of what, 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 what. Then I tried, hey, the quality of the output jump up by one grade, you know. Ah. So imagine if you put all these things, how much better it will be. Actually, you saw just now, right, I showed you the six-week lesson plan. The more I added, the better it became, right? Same thing, same thing. So we need to change our students' mindsets on how to prom well. That is the first thing. Second one, change mindsets of what drafts look like. Like I say, like illusion of finality. So we need to change. Right now, students think that draft is what? Bullet point. So we need them to overcome this idea that it's not about bullet point. Okay, it can be well-written pieces. And what's more important is this, huh? that provide us with... You see, right now, what I'm seeing is that students, when they see the output, because of illusion of finality, they either reject wholesale or take the whole thing wholesale. There is no nuance in between uh, to, to look out for what I like to call nuggets of gold. They, students are not doing that. So we need to actually cultivate this habit in our students to pick out good ideas, nuggets of gold from that. Yeah? And then change the mindset. Not as an answer generator, but as a companion, collaborative tool, consultative companion. Yeah? Now, I like to talk about this. Uh, it's like collaborative synergy. right? Just because I can talk to a human doesn't mean I'm good at group, uh, group dynamics, right? team dynamics. right? So likewise, just because I can prompt doesn't mean I'm good at collaborating with the AI. So we need to teach them how to do it well yeah? and look for those nuggets of code. So as a general rule, right, it, it looks like this, like, basically. You feed it with an idea, then you look out for nuggets of code in the output. And then you, you incorporate the, some of those nuggets of code back into your idea, and then you take the, and then you plant it back into chat GPT. Now, sometimes you go back and forth 10 times, uh, you, you will, your quality of your, your thing gets better and better, right? 
uh, I, 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 I show you an example. Like the title of this of this uh, presentation, initially so long, right? Shorten the title of this talk. Now look, the initial one was educational futures with ChatGPT and Gen. Don't lie. It's okay. Regenerate. Yeah. Now students is I don't like. Stop. Put aside already. So no. Regenerate. Uh, Gen AI in education shaping tomorrow's classroom. Then I said, okay, nice idea. I like the direction. So so then, but I don't like the phrasing. So I change it myself lah. Like, and then, but uh, this is our talk, right? Other things like writing. What 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 do I do now? I'm I'm doing this. You know, sometimes I have you know writer's block, right? I have ideas, but they're incoherent. So I put all the ideas in no particular order, and I say, hey, sort it out for me. So, so now it's sorted out for me. And then I say, okay, I like this, I like this sequence. Okay, I keep. The next one, I don't like the sequence, I, I reject. Like that. And then we keep feeding it back, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The other day, I had this beautiful moment, you know. I had these three things in the paper I was writing, but I didn't know how to connect. Then I back and forth 10 times, you know, finally come up one sentence that string the three things together. I was like, yes, yes, yeah. So that is the way that, 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 that we should collaborate, yeah? But then, the question is this, like, to teach these three mindset shifts on its own is very dry, right? How do we do this? Right? And especially for it to be effective, it needs to be conditioned regularly over time. Yeah, and and I also mean it for ourselves. You know, like if we want to be masterful with this, we also need to condition these users users over time. I didn't start out like that. I had to actually make the effort to uh, incorporate it into my work process. I know some of us say, "Oh, I, I like to do things myself." I know, I know. But if you want to be ready for the future and show our students, we need to also know how to work like that. Yeah. So here are two ways that we can incorporate into the classroom. Yeah. Uh, one is called AI enhanced learning. So we teach students to use AI as a consultative tool. So we already expose them to the idea. One of the first things we can do is that when we introduce them to ChatGPT, we break the mindset that it is not an answer generator. What can we do? Like in this activity that I conducted, right? I make them come up with the idea first. Then I tell them you feed the idea into the ChatGPT and get feedback from it. That already frames the whole uh, activity different, the use of chat, uh, chat GPT differently. Yeah? So we can do that. And then we say, okay, get the feedback, evaluate the feedback. Is, does it apply? Does it not apply? Other things we can do is say, okay, you get the AI to produce a draft, okay? Now, some of you are worried, right? Like, like where, where the students uh, cheat, right? Then you make them add the comments up or, 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 or turn on track changes for editing. And then you can see their work on the side, right? And then they are forced to evaluate the draft. And this is great for, for helping them to learn how to write better and present better and so yeah. Other things we can do is, I, I did this, because I teach Chinese philosophy, right? So I, I did this Confucius GPT. <laughs> so, so, so AI uh, role play as Confucius. Dear yeah, Confucius, I am okay. Then. Ah, my dear seeker of wisdom. <laughs> Confucius didn't really talk like that. But anyway, but what, what did I do? I tell them, okay, you come up with your own interpretation of the text first. Then, you talk to it, uh, ChatGPT. Okay? The first question is, do you learn anything? The weaker students all say yes. They learn something new. They learn a new perspective within consider. How far or near? Then this is we make them evaluate. Yeah. Ah, then they say, yeah, we think it's, it's, it's reasonable interpretation or we reject this. Gets their brains working, yeah? Now this is very I got this idea from Harvard. Harvard has this. Prom, uh, you see the prom, right? You like to think of prom as one sentence. This prom is like, right? Harvard design, but I adapted it. Uh, a prom where you can get the student to talk to the AI about the essay. So let me show you what happens. Uh. Here's one of my students' essays, okay? So I'm pretending to be the student, uh, right? Then what the AI does is it talks about, okay, hello, student. Here are the strengths, okay? These are the things that you did well. Here are your areas for improvement, okay? Wow. And then it ends the conversation by giving questions for the student. How do you plan to deepen your analysis? What areas will you incorporate more evidence of? Ah, and the student must respond. So I, pre I, I pretend, uh, I say, I guess I could cite more primary and secondary resources. Okay, thanks for this and blah, blah, blah. Here's, and then more questions. So basically, uh, the AI is having uh, a conversation, the student is having a conversation with the AI on how areas where they can improve their essay. Ah, isn't that great? Let's work for us also, right? <laughs> no. So, so this are uh, you see, you can give them reflective questions to, to consider. Yeah. So that's AI enhanced learning, right? The next one we can do is what I call AI collaborative learning, and this is what I really think is the future of uh, education. Because think about it, uh, 
if I want to cultivate soft skills with students, uh, and I want to do it well, what does it mean? It's very labor intensive, right? I need to sit down in front of the student one by one, correct? Yeah? Very labor intensive. We've got time, right? So it turns out AI can role play. You can get it to role play different roles and refine different aspects of soft skills. Yeah? So here's one train explanation skills. You tell the, the AI, pretend you're a confused student. So the student must explain the concept to the AI. Ah, then teach them how to, 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 to explain. Yeah? Another one is, oh, I love this. I sat down, let me tell you a story, right? I sat down with one of my colleagues from social work. All right? What's one of the problems with uh, industrial attachment? We, right now, for a lot of disciplines, we teach them with case studies, correct? And the problem with case studies is the student memorize like three case studies or five case studies, right? They go out, then they meet the client. The client doesn't meet any of the, set, uh, doesn't match any of the case studies. Then what happened? Their brain hang, they freeze, they don't know how to respond, right? So this is great because we are able to do more than what case studies can do. We give the student a chance to practice over text the, how they are supposed to approach the client, okay? So we tell the AI that if the student is doing it well, open up. If not, you know, show some like, uh, right? So this is a client with mental health uh, uh, issues, right? So then, uh, oh, how can I help you today? I'm not sure. Then the, the more empathetic the student is, the more the AI opens up, right? And then the student gets instant feedback if the uh, student says something wrong. Like, like, for example, what's the one thing you should never say to someone with mental health issues? Don't, don't, don't think too much, right? Don't think too much. You're overthinking it, right? Have you tried not thinking about it? Then you see, I appreciate you trying to help. Like, yeah, right? So that's great. Imagine if you have a class of 20 students. What does this mean? We have 20 conversations that students can read and learn all the best practices and things to avoid doing. Ah, I do this with my, my TAs. I train my undergrad students to be teaching assistants. We do this. We, I mean, not with AI, like, but with face-to-face. -face. And then they learn, oh, there are so many ways to do a certain thing, right? So it expands their vocabulary. Ah, oh, what to take from for is it? Oh, okay. yeah, anyway, so then you can also ask, at the end of the conversation, you can ask for feedback. So the AI can give feedback, right? But here's what you did well. Here's what you did well. Here are the areas of improvement. You know one amazing thing that, that, that uh, new opportunity this open up, we then, because AI can hallucinate, right? You all heard of the term hallucinate? Sometimes you'll say the wrong thing, right? We can use that uh, as an opportunity, you know? You tell the student, look back at the conversation. Is this accurate? Then you start reflecting on their work. Wow. So now we give them an opportunity to reflect on what they say, and uh, as they try to evaluate, is the uh, um, feedback accurate for them or not, or is there anything else missing? In a real face-to-face -face setting, this is not possible, right? After the conversation, you tell them the feedback, then they go off already, right? They cannot review. Now we give them a chance to review, yeah? Then, also, one, one of the other things about the empowerment is, uh, you give the student the prompt, right? The student can take the prompt, go home, edit for other scenarios to practice and gain confidence. Yeah. And that's how you are saying, but this is just text conversation. It's not like the real face-to-face, -face, right? What I can tell you is this. One thing I notice in our students is the problem is what? Low confidence. It's more an emotional response. So what we just need to do is to give them that emotional boost, that confidence. They must feel that they are confident. Then they can perform. So this is already very good at giving scaffolding so that they feel confident enough to then go on to meet actual people. Yeah? So this is very empowering. Of course, like here's, here's an example, dentistry, same thing. Uh, empathy, you know, uh, medicine and dentistry, one of the key uh, aspects of the training is what? Developing empathy, developing what we call bedside manners, right? And part of it is also, how do you communicate in a way that is not heavy with jargon? Yeah? So we can tell the AI, if the person gives you jargon, respond uh, with anxiety, because you're a nervous patient, you don't like the dentist, right? Ah, so then they get feedback, oh, yeah? If I keep saying, oh, you've got necrosis, like, blah, 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 then the AI is like, oh, what does that mean? I'm very afraid. You even show uh, uh, like emojis, you know. Uh, can you explain in a simpler way? So they get their feedback. Again, good training. Sometimes we want to train students to respond to objections, correct? What's the typical way that we do in the classroom? We say, okay, hypothetically, imagine you argue this. Here is the objection. How would you respond? The students are detached from the exercise because it's not their argument. So what do we do? 
AI now takes that argument and presents a personalized objection that they have to respond to. Then they got the strong investment in, in, in wanting to defend properly. So that is that, that's another opportunity. At the end of the day, so there are two strategies, right? I talked about three mindset shifts and two ways that we can uh, employ AI in the classroom. AI enhanced learning, AI collaborative learning, right? Again, so one of the questions is, what is our role as educators if AI is going to be more and more human-like, right? And I think what's important is for us to recognize that at the end of the day, learning is a social activity. We all could be watching stuff about AI uh, at home, but you all made a conscious decision to come here. Why? Because it's a social activity. There is something to be gained in being in the presence of others, or, to, or just to share the, our, our excitement or, or insights with others, right? Students need that too. So I see that our role as educators may evolve to be facilitators, facilitators of these kinds of discussions. That's one. But the other thing is this. Uh, one of the things that I realized is that when ChatGPT came out, suddenly you notice the media so much distrust, correct? Oh, students are going to cheat. Students are going to Where did that come from? Right? And, and this is written by one of my students. How do I prove my innocence? Casting students as would-be cheaters eager to export AI to is disheartening. Many students really want to learn. Why would they cheat? Not enough time, not enough interest, or not, not enough confidence in their abilities, right? These are human factors. And so if we want to uh, uh, prevent cheating, then we as educators must address these issues. Yeah? If there's not enough time, let's figure out a way to change our educational policies, to give them more time to work on the assignment. Not confident, how do we boost the confidence? Not interested, how do we boost the interest? Right? But at the heart of it, trust is the foundation of education. And it, it was very bizarre for me to see that uh, when, AI, when ChatGPT came out, suddenly so many teachers are like, ah, students are going to cheat. Ah, there's so much distrust with the students. Where did that come from? And the students are relying on us, whether we, we, we realize it or not, they are relying on us, on our feedback. This, this student actually opened my, my mind on feedback uh, in many ways. You know? He was saying, when a teacher talks to me, that I sometimes perceive the, the, the feedback as, as gold. And it matters a lot, especially negative feedback is very crushing. right? And so, uh, one of the things that will enable me to uh, really rely on, on the teacher and on myself more is if the teacher shows interest in my growth and development. If the teacher shows, gives me like feedback and says, ah, I want you to, to improve in these areas, then I will take my learning seriously. I will rely more on the teacher's feedback than on the AI. So that's something, that's some food for thought for us. Lah, that, that we should rely, yes, there's technology, but don't forget the human factor, the human element. Okay, so thank you very much. Yeah, uh, okay. Hallucinations. Uh, okay, how many of you, uh, first time hearing this term hallucination? Just such a show hand. Okay, so why does an AI hallucinate? I got a good, a good way to explain this. AI uh, is like model student. You, you know, primary school, we always tell, tell students, I'll uh, memorize all these model answers, correct? ChatGPT is what? Like, trained on the whole internet. So it memorizes all the answers, correct? It answers well when your question matches the model answer. It's like the, the student memorized model answer exam come out, wow, I just regurgitate all right, the answer, correct? Perfect. Why is the answer uh, wrong? Hallucination. Because sometimes we like the exam, let's say the exam question come out, not related to the model answers. What will the student do? Maybe pick one line from one model answer, pick another line from another model answer, put together, correct? Ah, then that kind of answer can be hit or miss also. ChatGPT does something similar as well. That's why it can hallucinate, and that's why it can create all this false information, right? So this is why we also need to teach our students to have that healthy skepticism, yeah? Got answer, looks polished, can, but looks can be deceiving, yeah? Have, is it really accurate? Is there more to it? Ah, we should probe our students to question in that direction, lah. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting to talk about the, the performance thing, because one of the things that worries me, uh, and maybe it might expand our scope as educators is, if AI gets more and more capable, right, uh, and, and now there's AI friends, you, you, you know that's what the, the kids are talking to nowadays, AI friends, right? AI is more patient, more, it's essentially more human than a human, right? It's more patient, more kind, like, like if your friend comes out and complains to you about their life, 10 times you're really like, ah, can you shut up, right? AI will never tell you that. And one of the things that worries me is that students are going to say, hey, 
AI is a better friend than all my friends, right? <laughs> and, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've read about that. So I think one of the things that that we as educators must explore, right, is what then is our place as humans being less perfect than an AI? Is there value in that? Why is that value? Yeah, I mean, I'm, right now, off the top of my head, I'm thinking, you know, like, uh, Jap Japanese aesthetics is this thing called wabi-sabi, beauty in imperfection, right? Maybe we need to explore these areas to show that, yeah, we are less perfect than an AI, but you know what? We're not performance machines. AI can be performance machine, right? But we be imperfect, and that's okay. So we need to somehow play up the narrative and say, it's okay to be less perfect than an AI. That's, that's an interesting point. So I, I like to, 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 to say this, you know, like, when Google and Wikipedia came out, uh, they were social levelers because mm, Google and Wikipedia, what did they do? They made knowledge accessible to everyone. Everyone has equal access. ChatGPT is really an uh, idea generator. What he has done is that he's made ideas equally accessible to everyone, right? Which is great. I mean, yeah, the worry, on one hand, if people use it poorly, then, then they're just going to like, use ideas. But if we look at the history of how Google and Wikipedia has what has happened is that equal access to information and knowledge has what? Resulted in more ideas, more flourishing of ideas, more exchange of ideas. Maybe if everyone has equal access to many ideas, many great ideas, we'll see a, a greater flourishing of ideas. That, that's possible. What, one of the things, there was one, one professor who was saying, uh, if everyone has access to ChatGPT, that means everyone has access to the same quality of work. And in the workforce, you won't stand up. In the business world, cannot form a niche, the business will die. So at the end of the day, we still need a little bit of the human ingenuity. Take whatever the AI gives, add value to be their own. Yeah. Of course, I, I will admit that like, it can be a bit harder like, because it's higher order thinking, right? So, so we have to start training our students to engage in more higher order thinking, maybe even at an earlier age. One of the worries that I do have about the future of employment is that you see what it can do now, right? it's capable of doing some entry-level white-collar jobs already. And what it means is that all we need is like fewer senior-level staff to review the work that AI produces, right? Now, what does this mean? All things being equal, right? It will mean that there will be fewer places for entry-level jobs. Oh, that's worrying, right? It will create a gap. Yeah. But it also means that there will be a greater demand for people with senior-level experience. Then we have this contradiction, right? If fewer people have access to, to entry-level jobs to gain experience, how are they going to get that senior? I've been in discussions with some, some colleagues and, and the, the idea is that perhaps some of these senior-level experience things may have to trickle down the education system. So it may be something that we have to look at already. How can we plan scenarios, case studies or whatever to equip our students with, uh, to gain access or, or knowledge to, to this kind of senior-level way of thinking? Oh, actually, I haven't asked. <laughs> Shall we ask? <laughs> actually, these are some of the things that, that, I've been, that, that I said earlier, right? Reflectivity. Uh, I, I, I recently heard some, some people talking about uh, preparing learners to be ongoing learners uh, after graduation. And one of the key skills is actually reflectivity. Yeah? Ah. So, 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 yeah, this is not for me, this is for the AI. I think these are, these are pretty, pretty sensible. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a heartening thought, right? It goes back to the fact that we still need humans. So we still have a job. <laughs> but our scopes would have evolved like, over the, uh, in the months and years to come. Yeah? yeah. Ah, okay. My advice is play with ChatGPT, uh, form your own communities to share the best practices. Right now, like I said, like the binder clips, right? We are limited by our lack of exposure. So one thing you can do, and one thing that has really helped me is I went to Reddit. Reddit, uh, r slash chat GPT, a lot of people share a lot of good practices, right? Go there and, and learn. Uh, I think uh, if we can, we should fill, form a kind of repository of good teaching practices. Yeah? And, and then we, we build up that repository. And then we say, ah, this is a good idea. We can then expand these hours to other subjects. Yeah, so, so that's something you can do. Yeah. So I'll, I'll say this, like, I, I, I do want to encourage everyone, if you haven't tried, please create an account, go home and try. If you're already using, 
experiment with making your prompts longer, right? It doesn't have to be one sentence. I tell you one, one interesting story I had. Uh, I, one of my groups, uh, five students, right? Four social science majors, one literature major, okay? The four social science majors struggled to come up with uh, accurate and precise prompts. Whatever they typed, uh, the, the AI gave, gave things that, that weren't up to their, their expectation. But the lead major, and this is consistent across classes with lead majors, uh, the lead majors are so articulate, they write better prompts, you know, and the prompts really can do fantastic things. So I believe, uh, like, maybe there is something in, uh, in the study of uh, literature that, that, that helps people to be better prompters. Yeah. So I, I, I think there is something there that we, that we should look at. They're more articulate. They're more able to articulate what they, what they want. Yeah. Okay, if you have no further questions, please join me to thank Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.